you know, in the gut microbiome, one of the big, you know, in a sense, the gut microbiome researchers have found that a greater amount of diversity, like a high diversity score, it's very beneficial overall for reducing all cause chronic inflammation. But what I found out after I had my bristle test and you guys looked at my oral microbiome was my diversity was high in my mouth. And uh, the analyst that was going over it with me, she said, you know, that's actually not good in the mouth. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting, you know, it's still an area that we're exploring a lot. We, I totally agree. I mean, unlike the gut microbiome where higher diversity is linked to improved gut health, we, we tend to find a bit of a Goldilocks effect with the oral microbiome. So too high of diversity doesn't necessarily mean that you have poor oral health, but it is correlated mm -hmm. with worse outcomes. Mm -hmm. and, and we get into a lot of the relationships between different species that are present in your oral microbiome, their relative abundances. Um, obviously, too few bacteria can also be a really bad thing. Um, so we have cases of, of individuals that have, you know, less than 10 species that we've been able to detect and put that in context. You know, on average, we find somewhere between 70 and 100 different bacterial species per sample. So, you know, we have these cases of ultra low diversity. And in a lot of those cases, the oral microbiome is just completely dominated by a single pathogenic bacteria that's that's really wreaking havoc mm -hmm. on somebody's oral health. Um, so as of now, based on our understanding, you know, there is kind of this, this sweet spot of oral microbiome diversity where you have a really good balance of commensal bacteria and there may be a couple pathogenic species in there, but it's not enough to overpower at the community level um, the oral microbiome balance and really affect your oral health. Yeah, it's really interesting. Actually, I want to take a moment and share my bristle scores here for those that are watching on video here. So here is here are my my scores and just you know a little bit about my history is fortunately, thank God, never had a cavity. Um, you know, I brush, floss, I oil pull every single day, and uh, I did have braces for for several years when I was younger. But uh, I don't know how much that impacts the oral microbiome or how that plays a role in it. But um, yeah, every time I go into the dentist, which is usually once a year, get my teeth clean, maybe once or twice a year, um, they always say, oh, my teeth look great. So uh, that's just my a little bit of my background. And uh, yeah, we can go through some of these markers because I think this is really key so people can understand more about how bristle works and and kind of the the biomarkers you guys are looking at. So you know, we've got commensals here. And I'll let you I'll let you take it from there. Yeah. Yeah. So on the left hand side, we have basically all of your health related biomarkers. We have commensals, which are largely going to be those beneficial bacteria contributing to good oral health, helping to maintain balance. Um, your diversity score we just touched on, but it is a relatively complex <laughs> calculation, but essentially tells you, you know, how many different kinds, how many different species did we detect? What were their relative abundance? What is the spread across all of the different microbes in your oral microbiome? Nitrate reduction. Um, so that score actually measures the capacity of your oral microbiome to reduce nitrate into nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a really important molecule for maintaining cardiovascular health, maintaining a good um, blood pressure status. And we find that people with low nitric or nitrate reduction scores in their oral microbiome have a lower capacity to perform that mm. um, that transition from nitrate to nitric oxide. And I was low there. I had a 2.3 out of 10, which was marked as low. Exactly. And you'll see all of the specific bacteria that we yep. detected. So the first ones we show you are the ones in the highest abundances um, for a given right. score. So you'll see two of the species there. And then we actually just added the, the different characteristics that you're seeing on the bottom. These are some of the, the most important characteristics when it comes to intervening. So trying to either reduce the abundance of pathogenic bacteria or increase the abundance of commensals. And if we go up to one of the, the kind of disease-related scores, um, yeah, yeah. you'll start to see specific sensitivities. Yeah, so if you just right scroll all the way yeah. to the top. Yeah. So on the right-hand side, we have all the disease-related scores, halitosis, um, commonly known as bad breath, and there's a lot of different varieties of 
bad breath, obviously, you know, everybody at one point or another kind of wakes up with coffee breath or you just ate garlic or an onion or something like that. And that's one kind of halitosis. Um, but then there's, you know, the more chronic version, which is really rooted in the oral microbiome and the bacteria growing there. And then we have the gum inflammation score, so score related to periodontal disease. And you'll see your score um, and you'll also see how you compared against two different sets of patient cohorts. So we performed a clinical research study with the University of Pacific Dental School, and we were obtaining samples of oral microbiome. Um, well, we were generating oral microbiome data from the salivary samples of patients, and we were correlating that against the electronic dental and electronic health records. And that helped develop the algorithm and the biomarkers that you see here. But you can see that you know, we've normalized the scores, but the idea is that patients who are in that study who were diagnosed by a dentist as healthy tended to have a score of around 3.3, and then patients who were diagnosed with periodontal disease were at 6.6. Mm -hmm. um, so with this one, I was high. I was at 8.2. So I, exactly. have a, I have a higher propensity for gum inflammation. Fortunately, I do take good care of my oral health. And that may be a fa big factor in me keeping it under control. Definitely. And then this and breaks see, down and shows you exactly yeah. the bacteria. So if you're not watching on video, if you're listening to the podcast, it actually, like I click on a, on the link next to the gut gum inflammation. So they had me marked at 8.2 out of 10 with, uh, so that's high. So it's high score for, for gum inflammation. And then I can actually look at the different species and what the, what their individual scores are. So this one here. Poor for I'm gonna this is some some of these can it's be okay. tough to I read. Them poor too. for monis, <laughs> endotalis, endodontalis, very high nine point five score right. So I can actually see which bacteria in particular. If you're you know if you're if you're really interested in what's happening in the microbiome, you can obviously get to see what bacteria are high, um, and that helps you understand more about what's happening in your mouth. Exactly. And if you actually click on the bacteria, there usually will have some extra educational information. Mm. And under the characteristics, so we just added this feature, but there are certain characteristics to different microbes that make them more susceptible to certain interventions or can help guide at home or in clinic care. So if you click on uh, maybe rutarin sensitive, that green circle next to the bacteria. Yeah. So you'll see. Uh, a description. It's a lot of content. We're going to make it a little bit easier to, to navigate. But if you click on rutarin sensitive, so the second kind of pull down. So yeah. this bacteria is sensitive to uh, a type of bacteriosin, which is a, a protein that's produced by other kinds of bacteria, so commensal bacteria, which we had mm -hmm. talked about earlier. And certain kinds of these bacteriosins have really effective properties that can help reduce the abundance of the other pathogenic bacteria. So you can almost imagine a war going on in your oral microbiome. And if you can increase the abundance of commensal bacteria that produce these repairing bacteriosin, it's a really good way to reduce the abundance of Porphyromonas endodentalis. And I've kind of butchered that one as well. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And it's interesting because the this is really fascinating. And you know, if I was a especially if I was a dentist, I would really want to understand this better. If I was a dental hygienist, if I was working in that specific field, I would really want to understand what's happening with all these bacteria, the sensitivity, because we know antibiotics or I'm sorry, probiotics themselves secrete antibiotic substances. And they compete, right, for for space, for food, things like that, with other bacteria. And um, you know, Lactobacillus ruteri is has been pretty well researched to help improve the oral microbiome. So this is kind of showing, like, this particular bacteria, you know, that we've been talking about, the Porphyromonas endodentalis, is is sensitive to that to that Lactobacillus ruteri. If you were to take that, and they have oral probiotics now where you can just kind of open the capsule or just take a little powder and put it in your mouth and swish it around to help reduce that. Exactly. And the really exciting thing I think about the oral microbiome that's that's a little bit more difficult with the gut microbiome, you know, our mouths are just so accessible 
And, and that provides this really unique opportunity to use a combination of physical intervention. So we think about things like brushing your teeth, oil pulling, flossing, tongue scraping, to physically remove these pathogenic bacteria and create the space that you need to introduce biologic or more therapeutic interventions like a probiotic. And we see a lot of success. You know, it, it, neither one will necessarily be the most effective on its own, but the combination and being able to do both and really change the, the environment and our mouths has just had amazing results for our users. Yeah, really fascinating. And and so on my disease score, my halitosis or bad breath was moderate. My gum inflammation was high, 8.2 out of 10. My tooth decay was 0 out of 10. So I, 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 I cleared out really well with that. And then my gut inflammation was a 5 out of 10, so moderate. And for me, I've had a history of irritable bowel. When I get stressed, my gut is kind of like my weak, my weak link, right? It starts to, to break down a bit. So, so this makes a lot of sense. And there's a lot of links too between gum and gut inflammation. Exactly. And a lot of links between gum inflammation and, and halitosis. So if you, you scroll mm -hmm. down under yeah. halitosis, we've actually yeah. been able to um, we've been able to identify and develop six buckets of, of halitosis. Um, yeah, here's our guy, Porphyromonas and Dentalis, yeah. right? So that's not only gut gum inflammation, but also a marker for halitosis there too. Yeah, and you'll see in the section above, so we we kind of characterize what's driving your halitosis. And in your case, I think I noticed that it was um, primarily driven, if you just scroll up a little bit, yeah, um, primarily driven by, so the, the gum inflammatory bacteria, those periodontal disease causing mm. bacteria, but we've been able to also identify you know, there's certain kinds of halitosis that are really driven by uh, fungi that grow on the surface of the tongue that are related to oral thrush. We've seen other kinds of, of halitosis that are driven by pathogenic bacteria that are, you know, located in your gut. We have seen some cases of H. pylori pop up. Yeah. It's been really interesting for our team. And we're continuing to kind of go down this path of more precise characterization of different oral conditions because, you know, as we see here, periodontal disease or cavities it's it's not a it's an umbrella term for the resulting symptom of what's actually a, a multifactorial disease yeah yeah for sure and, and as you guys are getting more and more data you're, you're continually updating this database so like the more samples you get because it's interesting because you'll say like about 35.2 percent of bristle users share my my um halitosis type right so i've got um, this elevation in the, my, my most prominent bacteria is this porphyr, porphyromonas endodentalis, again, a marker for gum inflammation as well as for halitosis when it's elevated. And so it'll actually compare that to the other, the other amount of users that have that score. So very interesting how you guys are able to, to kind of calculate all of this and kind of put all of this data together. And so kind of going back up here, I was talking about how my gut inflammation was a five out of 10. Let's take a look at that one. Major species there is the Campylobacter. Yeah, so C. Shoe, um, very common, common bacteria that we detect that's related to gut inflammation. I, I believe it's implicated in the gut microbiome as well, probably detected in many of the tests that it's, are available on the market. Hmm. And yeah. you'll see, you know, certain oral bacteria, P. gingivalis, F. nucleatum, again, major, major players in, in periodontal disease as well. And the idea, really the idea behind bristle and, and kind of our, our thought or the principle that we operate under is this idea that good health starts with a healthy mouth, right? And I think that when we see the connections between species like P. gingivalis and its role in periodontal disease and then its role in gut dysbiosis and colorectal cancer and Alzheimer's and cardiovascular disease. There, there really is this opportunity that we have to, for a lot of people, I think, go from zero to one in terms of our oral, oral health and have this major impact in our overall health as well. Yeah, absolutely. And then once you get all of this, they also give, set you up with a care plan here. And so it kind of says, all right, care plan, goals, reduce gut inflammation, bacteria, 14 weeks, 
And it says greater than 90% of the people who followed these recommendations for six months saw improvement in their oral microbiome. And so they have a phase one reset, which is like two weeks. And they give me a routine to follow brushing, flossing, a certain mouth rinse, tongue scraping, right? Trying to remove stuff and all that. Yeah. Why don't you jump in there? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the care plans are custom design based on your results. And the idea we break each care plan down roughly into two phases, especially if that primary goal is um, reducing one of those disease related scores, obviously for somebody with great scores all around, our, our focus is to just maintain. Um, but we, we tend to break things down into two phases. So the first phase is really focused on removing the pathogenic bacteria. And that goes back to what I was talking about as far as physical intervention, some biologic or therapeutic intervention, which we see with the mouth rinse. And then the second period and the majority of the time, you know, once we've really kind of gone through this scorched earth protocol is rebuilding your oral microbiome from the ground up and really trying to seed those beneficial bacteria and get you into a really balanced state. And then after that care plan, we we tend to provide everybody with kind of a maintenance protocol, right? So so this is a, a very focused, you know, 14 weeks of, of resetting your oral microbiome. And then we have a whole set of recommendations on what to do after that. Yeah. So they, they give recommendations for the tongue cleaner, the mouth rinse, the probiotic, all that kind of stuff that you can just go ahead and, and get right there. So again, two phases, first phase they gave me was two weeks. That's the reset. And then phase two, you know, is, is where they're in a sense, replenishing, supporting my oral microbiome. So, you know, really interesting, you know, what you guys are doing here. I think it's really fascinating. Yeah. I think every dentist should be doing something along those lines. (laughs) 